Welcome to the Sanctuary Podcast, hosted by Angel Deer. In this podcast, we explore the mysteries of spirituality and consciousness. In each episode, we dive deep into the realms of human experiences, our rapidly changing world, and the unseen realms, tapping into the universal wisdom that connects us all. Whether you're a seasoned spiritual seeker, starting to awaken to the possibilities of a more expansive reality, or want support on your journey, this podcast is for you. Join me as we explore topics such as shamanism, spiritual transformation, holistic healing, the medicine path, energy healing, plant medicine, ancient wisdom, and more. Our guests are respected elders and experts in their fields, and we'll learn from their insights and experiences as we journey together on the path of spiritual growth. If you can, please consider supporting this podcast by joining our Patreon page at patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. Once again, it is patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. Now, let's dive into today's episode. Today's episode is a little bit different because this is the replay of my interview with uh, Raven with uh, Plant Save My Life podcast. And Raven interviewed me to discuss how plants and how the natural world is able to heal us and what has been my connection to them and how they really saved my life. How in times where I was really lost and didn't find any more purpose in my life, something deeper was calling me. In fact, at the height of my corporate success and uh, my entrepreneurial career, I felt this deep calling. I didn't know yet what was coming. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew the life uh, that I had was not my life. It was a life I learned through society, through parents, through belief. And I had to do a lot of shading. I had to do a great departure. And I went to India, I basically sold everything I had and I left with uh, not that much money, in fact, uh, and started to go into a work of service. And I feel that this is this work that really opened my life into a deep spirituality and embodied spirituality of service. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, I really had great pleasure uh, being interviewed by Raven. And please share, share also and check his podcast, Plan Save My Life. You can find the link below here. And uh, yeah, I see you very soon for another podcast too. Hey everyone, Raven here with another episode of Plan Save My Life. This week, we are sitting down with Angel Deer. That is his real name, and I'm very excited to share this conversation. Angel has trained as a veterinarian, medicine man, mystic, permaculturist, meditation teacher, herbalist, minister, international speaker, beekeeper, and many more. Previously, he was nominated Entrepreneur of the Year, recognized as an Earth Rock Star, and even served as an advisor for the United Nations Population Fund. But he gave all that away and has now dedicated his life to remembering, learning, and teaching ancient wisdom through the lineages of Andean cosmology and Norse shamanism. He does this by running The Sanctuary, a shamanic healing center located in New York, but he is also the founder of the New York Bee Sanctuary, a national nonprofit advocating for the preservation of bees and pollinators. He and I are going to discuss reclaiming our own sanity and health through relearning our connection to the land, plants, and ancient wisdom. So join me as we welcome Angel to the show. Awesome. Thank you, Angel, for being able to join us today on Plant Save My Life. You have such an extensive background. I would love for you to just introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, my name is Angel Deer, and I live on uh, Lenape territory that is now called uh, Catskills, upstate New York, two hours from New York City. Um, I am a holistic medicine practitioner. I work with energy healing, breath work, uh, plants, land connection, native traditions, 
And, uh, you know, I've been living in the U.S. for 20 years now. I'm originally from Corsica, a small island in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, I could say much more, but <laughs> let's, let's start it there, I guess. Yeah, truthfully, I feel that you could write a book and I would be first in line to read it. Recently, you made a post on social media about how 10 years ago, you abandoned a more Western lifestyle, purchased a one-way ticket to India, and it kind of catalyzed these changes in your life. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, sure. Well, I did probably spend around um, 20 years in the corporate world. So I trained as a veterinarian originally. So I have a PhD in veterinary medicine. Oh, wow. And I worked for uh, pet food companies. And then I worked in different industries, luxury industry. I was CEO of different companies in France, in UK, and then in US. That's how I arrived here in the United States. Um. And then I ended up starting my own business in the internet uh, realms. Uh, I was the CEO and the founder, the co-founder of a company that was selling baby products, basically. So products for pregnant women and women with children up to five-year-old. Uh, I raised a lot of money for that company, uh, close to 50 millions from different VC and built a company from scratch with a friend up to, you know, 200 employees and, you know, a big success story, let's say, in the, in the corporate world. Um, and what happened is, you know, as I, I guess, climbed the corporate ladder, as I got really successful in my own ventures, there was something in me that felt very uh, unresolved or empty, you know, however you want to put it. And uh, I guess the more I was getting successful, the more I could see that maybe this life was not about that. <laughs> Took many years, right? And, and you know, I was making good money and, and I love what I was doing. You know, it's not like I didn't like it. Uh, I enjoy building a business. I enjoy, you know, managing a team and working with my business partner and even raising money was kind of fun, even if it was exhausting at time. Uh, and then came a point, I mean, a few things happened, but I think one of the big one was uh, I got nominated to uh, be the Entrepreneur of the Year in the US. It's kind of a big award in the, I guess, in the entrepreneur community. And when I came on stage for this award, I just had this um, realization or looks like more like, I guess, uh, a lightning strike <laughs> that came through me kind of unexpected that this was a lie. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, you know, I, I don't know if I deserve the award. It, it doesn't really matter, but um, I realized that what I was representing what I was selling on stage was not who I am. So there was kind of a, a big stretch between the public figures. And, you know, we were doing like TV interviews and a lot of big programs out there. And there was a lot of things that led to that award, but I kind of could play that role, play the, the young CEO and, and the successful entrepreneur and, and all of that. But there was just this void inside, something that was telling me, this is not your life, right? And, and it's not really, I think sometimes people think, oh, it's because, you know, we I criticize this kind of career, right? I, I have friends that, in fact, my business partner of the time, I founded another startup and he's very successful at it and he's still running it. Uh, and... You know, so I have nothing against that. But for me, that was a misalignment. There was something else that was calling me. I had no idea what it was. I just knew that whatever I was doing was not it. And it was very blurry, but I literally came out of stage, uh, kind of fell on the ground on my knees and went into that very deep process about, I guess, the meaning of my life. 
the meaning of being alive, you know, what, why are we alive? What, what are we doing things? Where is that going? And I could just see that if I continue doing that, um, I was not going to be able to answer those questions. And I would probably go into depression or addiction or I don't know, you know, but I could just see it was not going to be a good path for me. Wow, that's that's really powerful. Thanks for sharing. I think that resonates with a lot of people as we try to climb. Even if you're climbing the corporate ladder, you're successful by all traditional descriptions of success. You're living the quote unquote American dream so much so that you're receiving awards for being entrepreneur of the year. That's incredible. But also feeling that level of unfulfillment, like this isn't what life's all about. The way the identity wraps up in with your career and you're receiving an award. But however, this isn't me. I'm receiving an award for something that isn't me. It's something I've worked on. And I think that there's a lot of discourse in a lot of people's souls, especially right now. I mean, we live in a culture where if you're lucky, you can skate past addiction and depression, and then you can just work until you retire and die. And that's like, like you said, that's not what we're meant to do. That's not connecting ourselves with. Yeah. And, you know, kind of avoiding it because I remember reading an article at the time in some prominent magazine and newspaper about the amount of uh, depression, alcoholism, addictions, I mean, you, you name it, people that can't sleep, that are overstressed in the uh, successful entrepreneurs community. You know, I'm not talking about the entrepreneur that really struggle, that don't have enough money for his company and, you know, things like that, but people that are successful, right, that have a big company and maybe they raise a lot of money and in fact, I can't remember the statistic, but I think it was around 70%. So it was like two thirds of the CEOs and entrepreneurs, in fact, are internally quite miserable. It, it was a huge number. And I think at the time also, as I was going through that process, a, a very famous CEO out there um, that raised a lot of money from prominent VCs committed suicide. And he was someone that I knew um, and that I would have never imagined to be so close to that edge. So there was a lot of pointers, right? There were things that, yeah, there's a facade. There is what you read in the, in the magazines, like entrepreneur magazines or, you know, some other business publication out there. But it doesn't tell the personal story, the personal struggles potentially. And, you know, sometimes we struggle in life, right? We, we go through stuff that is difficult and, you know, it's not always easy to, to run big companies or even to be an employee, right? But it doesn't mean that we go through processes that potentially can destroy us. And it seems like this constant run and chasing of something bigger and better all the time, which is, you know, what we were doing, right? We always had to raise money. We always had to grow the business, the revenue, the team. Um, it's never ending. So when do you put the stop? What, what is the metrics, right? And the metrics very often are, okay, how much money on my bank account? Or, you know, what, what is the potential big exit? So I can stop doing that. And then I'll do what is great or what I'm really called to, what I'm passionate about. And even in my previous industry, I work as a CEO for a big luxury French company. And there was a lot, I was friends with a lot of CEO in that industry. And I could just see that a lot of these people, if you go beyond the cocktail hours and uh, public, the PR article about them and their, their company, if you know their life, their life is not always that great, right? That doesn't mean everybody's like that. You know, there's people that probably have an amazing, fulfilling personal life and uh, sleep really well and don't have depression or have anxiety, but it's not the majority. And so there was definitely a lot of things that were telling me, okay, what is, what does it mean to be really successful in life? So that, that was my big question at the time. How do I define success? And I defined it through the society I'm living in that puts metrics on it. It is, you know, maybe the size of your house or the money on your bank account or, you know, the type of company you're running, the size of it and the money you've raised. And, and I was like, that, that's not my definition of success. I mean, if I'm not that happy inside, 
how, how much more money is going to make me happy. And in fact, there's a lot of study on that that proved that that's never going to make you happy. Uh, right. So yeah, I, yeah, I took a leap, I guess. I quit all of it. I was like, okay, I'm going to go on that quest. I'm going to go see if someone somewhere has some answers or maybe some better questions than the one I'm asking myself right now. That is so brave. That's so brave. How'd you do that? Well, I, you know, I'm very uh, spontaneous and I'm, uh, you know, I carry a lot of fire. And so that's very good for building businesses, but that's also very good for taking action. And I just kind of, uh, you know, I was already starting at the time for many years already, in fact, to work with some spiritual teachers. You know, I was studying Advaita Vedanta, so the Hindu scriptures, and I was fascinated by the teaching of duality and non-duality. Um, and I was doing yoga and I was doing, you know, other spiritual practices. And every time I would go to those classes, or I would be with my teacher at the time. I felt so nourished. I was like, this is food. This is like better than my top restaurant last night. <laughs> yeah, of course, being a cocktail hour wasn't, you know, of course it wasn't. Whenever you're nourishing your soul and your spirit, like that kind of schmoozing and stuff. Yeah, so that was my food. And I was like, okay, this is what I need to pursue. So. I didn't know what I would look like in terms of a career, I guess. That's how I thought about it at the time, right? In terms of job, what would be my next job, uh, my next company, or who I would work for. And uh, at the time, I was also working with, uh, with a quite famous uh, Shambhala monk out there. And I went to uh, a week training with him. And a uh, very interesting guy and uh, very profound teachings. And uh, yeah, I told him, I said, you know, this is what's going on. This is like, you know, and, and I told him, I think, uh, you know, I think I need to go to India in an ashram and go silent. I, I need to retreat from this world. And his answer was quite striking to me. Um, I don't know if we can use the F word on this podcast, but okay. So he was like, why the fuck do you want to go in an ashram? So you have to imagine the situation, right? The guy is much older than me. He's a monk and, and he answers this very direct question. And part of me, I think at the time, you know, when I look back now, I think a part of me wanted him to love me or appreciate me. And if I say, I'm going to want to go in an ashram, he's going to feel like, oh, amazing. Right. And he said, no, I said, you know, if you do that, and I've said that to many of my students since and people I work with, I say, you know, sometimes we are so inwards with ourselves that in fact, going in silence and all of that can in fact amplify those voices. And he said, you know, your life has been a lot about you already. Been a lot about you. So he said, what you should do, what I recommend is that, yeah, you can go to India but go to India to serve, to be of service. And he said, then in three months, in six months, in a year, at some point when you feel like you got that teaching, whatever I'm talking about here, at some point you will know, call me and I'll tell you where to go in terms of ashram. Right? <laughs> and a friend of mine, I'd worked with Moza Teresa for many years when she was still alive. And so I called my friend in New York and I said, hey, I think I'm going to go work at Moza Teresa, volunteer there. How do I do that? So she said, well, just take a one-way ticket, go to Kolkata and go at the door there and bang at the door and say, you want to serve. And you can work for a day or for your whole rest of your life. <laughs> they won't ask any question, They right? And that's what I did. You know, I... Literally got rid of everything I had. I left with one backpack. So I sold my car. I stopped renting my apartment. I sold everything I own. And I basically what was left of me was my backpack and what I carried with me. And I went from, you know, one extreme to another, right? New York City and the wealth and the easiness to Kolkata during the monsoon season. It was end of June, I remember. 
uh, and uh, extreme poverty and, you know, and working with, you know, the first home that Mother Teresa started there, which is the uh, home for the dying people. So basically you go outside, you look for, you find people that are not well and you bring them in and you wash them and clean them and take care of them until they passed away. You know, our whole motto was everybody should die with dignity. And so you offer some dignity to other human beings. And I walk in the, in the home for the, for the men. And, uh, that really completely changed my life in so many ways. I mean, so much that, you know, I spent over a year abroad and doing work of service and I never called back the monk that told me, called me to go to an ashram. I just got so transformed that I came back, uh, with a better direction, I guess, on my life. And I didn't know, need to do those things. And it was amazing for one year, you know, it was, nothing was about me. It was all about someone else. And it was, uh, probably one of the most profound, um, spiritual awakening experience that I experienced when I was there after a few months, I literally, uh, a full blown awakening as we can call it. Um, yeah, I still came back to New York a year later without knowing what I was going to do next, but I was carrying so much joy, so much, so much gratitude, so much like tranquility, happiness, bliss. I was just relaxed for the first time in, I think 40 years. That is a very powerful lesson in duality. I mean, honestly, coming from New York City and then going to India during the monsoon season, that's incredibly powerful. From going from a life that you were building up something for yourself, you're getting the award, and then to dedicating it to service. That's not only brave, I have to commend you for that, but I have to ask, what brought you back to New York? You know, at some point, um, then I went to work in Nepal for a few months, and then I worked in Sri Lanka, and... Wow. And then I ended up, my last mission was in the Philippines. A friend of mine, she's, uh, she's American, but she's from the Philippines and she runs a big nonprofit there and she needed some help on the ground. And so my, one of my last mission was to, you know, I was living in a, in a rice field and in a, in a school that were for the children of the farmers, the rice farmers. And, and we were doing permaculture projects and insect houses and cooking lessons and, nature and foraging and it, it was it was amazing it was really beautiful um and also I was you know always i choose during that travel to live life and experience life without the comfort that i could have access to so meaning i would you know live with those people in their home right and sleep you know very basic places like same in india i could have you know book a very nice hotel but i was like no i'm going to it doesn't feel right to spend, you know, f even $50 a night, which is a lot in India for a hotel. Uh, when during the day, you're going to take care of people that literally have nothing. Like aside from what they're wearing, that's pretty much the, the only thing they have. And so at some point came the question, okay, do I keep doing that? And that was a big pull towards that because I was just so happy that that was the thing, that there was no more question. It, I felt so like, Everything is fine. That that's life. And I met, you know, amazing people are doing that. People that do that for their life, right? That commit to that kind of life of service. And it was so inspiring. And then I realized, well, a lot of people in the United States and the country that I live really need, really are suffering too. And I know those people because uh, they were my friends sometimes. They were colleagues. They were, you know, people that live in my community. And I was like, people would benefit so much from all the things I've been learning these past years. And my personal transformation, I think, could really help people. And so I came back to the U.S. And then I started going back to Peru, which I've been right before leaving to start also studying with native people there. So I spent a lot of time in the jungle of Peru, especially with the Shipibo. And uh, 
and in the Andes, uh, in the mountain of Peru. Well, I don't know about everywhere, but let's say a few countries. <laughs> yeah, the drive was never, you know, the drive was never, oh, I want to go to Bali or I want to go to Costa Rica or I want to go to Peru because it's nice. Yeah, my, my drive was, I want to learn and I want to heal. And it's not about holidays. Like literally, I haven't taken any holidays in the past 15 years. People don't really believe that. They see I travel. But even when I travel, I'm going to see a teacher. I'm going to see an elder. I'm going to do something that is about development, right? And maybe that's a problem. I should be able to take holidays and relax. But I feel so called into my mission today that, you know, that's, that's, that's how I live my life. So yeah, I always did that. And I think after, you know, many years of doing that and all the elders I've met and the people I was working with, I, I really changed, you know, something was changing a little bit every day. I didn't realize, but at some point I was just a very different person. The big change was I was happy despite there was probably more uncertainty in my life than ever. That, it's not like I left with 5 million on my bank account, right? I, I left everything. I didn't take any money. I was like, I'm quitting, right? So I surrender my shares. Like people think, oh, famous entrepreneur, right? No, you have no money until you sell the business. And, and I left before it was sold. So I literally didn't leave with money, right? But somehow it didn't matter. Yeah, it was not, I was not afraid of that. Somehow I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I was successful before. If I need to take a job somewhere to make money, I'll do it, right? I can do it. I've done it before. So I didn't really worry about that anymore. I was more worried about the state of humanity and, 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 and what, what role do I play in that? What role do I want to play? You know, and that's what's more where what was daunting to me. The things that keep me up at night were very different. Yeah, I think that's something that definitely resonates with a lot of listeners because I, for one, would love to go to India, but I worry about the money aspect. But then, like you said, if you trust in yourself and you trust in the universe, um, that even if the future is uncertain, you can have that level of joy because you can trust that it's it's going to work. I mean, I'll make it work. Yeah, we don't <laughs> we don't really need that much money when we're in India, and I think you know, and I want to do that for my kids, and I want to do that for I tell that to everyone I meet. I think being truly of service, but in a way that is not about you at all. So that is not about, you know, yeah, that literally you're just going like almost like a one way street, right? Just to give what you're going to receive is going to be miraculous. And I've done, you know, amazing ceremonies and work with elders and things that have profoundly transformed me in the Andes and in the jungle and all that. But that experience in India, I mean, having a full-blown transformation, like literally awakening and kind of a Kundalini transformation, right? Like really you're so wide open that you can see beyond what's really in front of you and have a kind of broad understanding of what's at stake here was miraculous for me, you know, because I, I was a scientist, I was a business person, even if I always was spiritual and I always been attracted to that and studying the scriptures for many years already, that, that was a direct experience. And it was not because of anything but me being of service. And that's still, you know, that's more than 10 years now. I don't know how long it is, but um, yeah, that is 10 years in fact. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's so alive with me. So alive. How do you now bring that experience and that joy back to your own community that you, that you left a little bit ago? I mean, I come from, a yeah, a very retreat center here, you know, uh, I own the land and, you know, part of the land has a retreat center and part of the land is where I'm living. Uh, but I'm in service to that land, right? That's. It's like a marriage. Uh, you know, I always tell people, I think if you really want to transform, you need to settle somewhere and you put your nest. I think if you keep moving left and right and you don't put your hands in the soil, but not just for one month to help someone or six months there and then two years there, 
you're never going to understand this prayer of the earth. In fact, in Peru, where the lineage I've been studying now for a long time is from, in Indian cosmology, my teacher, when I wanted to study from him, I first had to chase him for years before he said yes, because he didn't want to be teaching at all. I mean, most of those people, they don't want to teach the good one. <laughs> they, they, they just want to, you know, live their, their life, right? And they're okay to be with you, but they don't really want to be called teachers. But anyway, the first things he told me, he said, you know, I say, you need to plant some seeds to learn how to grow them. I'm going to give you some corn. And corn is very sacred in Peru, like, you know, in Mexico and other part of Central and South America. And I want you to build a relationship with that corn. And once you have grown it, harvested it, and understand the cycle of giving your time and your energy and your attention and what you're going to get back from that, once you really understand what's going on there, come back to me and I'll teach you because you'll be ready. But he said, you need to stop praying for the earth. He said, all those prayers that everyone does doesn't matter if you don't not know how to be a caretaker, a real caretaker. Wow. Yeah. So it's the lessons of service. Yeah. And it was again, right? It's like being of service to, you know, what is it? That's one seed of corn. And... And that was my commitment, right? And now, you know, I'm 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 learning from him. But you know, my he, he's a medicine person. He's a he's teaching a few people, even if he doesn't call himself a, a teacher. Uh, but he's a farmer. He's a father. He's a beekeeper. He's a forager. He makes essential oils. He makes a lot of different things, right, from the land. Not to sell it, just because it's his way of contributing, right? And and yes, sometimes he teach, right? Sometimes he is an amazing teacher, by the way. He's an incredibly talented teacher of, of cosmologies in the stories of his ancestors. Uh, but he believes that we cannot learn any of that until we connect to the land in a proper way. And I think that's my difficulty, you know, when I have students and people that want to learn from me through our school or one-on-one. -on -one, is really attack, tell people, just come on the land and you're just going to spend the day weeding and pining woods and chopping woods and doing this and that. And they don't understand that this is the teaching. This is the most important because people want the magic. They want the, the secrets. They want the <laughs> special things, right? But if you cannot experience magic in your everyday life, in a simple act of just even sitting with a flower or an animal, you'll never find true magic in any other experiences. It doesn't matter if it's plant medicine or anything else, because that would be external. That would, that would be an experience, but it would not be embodied. It would be momentary. Yeah, you might have these big things, but it's not in your body fully yet. It's not anchored. It hasn't alchemized fully. And you see that a lot today, right? People go back and forth and they do a lot of ceremonies and they do that, you know, hundreds of them or they travel left and right. But they're so disconnected from even their parents, their family, their old friends from childhood that maybe is on a different path that they'll never find what they're really looking for. They think, you know, it's on that way, but I'm, I'm very more and more aware because I've seen it so many times now that that's what we need to do. And it's difficult, right? It's, it's, it's hard to return to the land. It's hard to live that way because you need to bring a whole different way of relating that we often have, haven't learned, right, from our parents. or We don't really have elders in our families, right, healthy elders. We don't often have cosmologies, stories, uh, lineages, rituals. And so we're a bit like a spiritual junkie, as I call it. <laughs> yes. We consume a bit of that and we do a bit of crystal and a bit of sound healing and a bit of Taoism and a bit of Taoism and a bit of Buddhism and a bit of shamanism, blah, blah, blah. But we never dive deep in one, like completely like, and go through the despair and the not answered question and the confusion and, but, but committed, like you are committed to your lover. <laughs> Right. 
So because that's how any ancestral lineage that I work with, that's how those elders lived or still live. They have this one connection and they tell you it's all about that. So we cannot really learn it in the way that we're just going to Starbucks every day by just going there, sitting, and then leaving. No, we have to learn to grow that coffee, not just drink it. (laughs) That's such a valid point because it's hard to get down there and be weeding for a day. It's hard to be down there in the soil and actually tending to the earth and devoting yourself to that connection. Like you said, everyone wants to experience the benefits. Everyone wants the magic, but the magic's always there. It's about being able to to access it, see it, and be aware of it. And especially talking about plant medicine and stuff, you mentioned that sometimes we'll, we will think that it'll help cure us or it'll help us make us get through these difficult journeys, especially mental or spiritual blockages that we might have. But a lot of the time, it's all about the connection to our family, the connection to our community, the connection to our identity sometimes even, how we got to heal those things. It's about integrating it so you see that every day, not just whenever you're experiencing it. Yeah, and you should be able to, you you can in fact do that without any of those plants, right? So, and we take those plants very often out of context, right? Because it's coming from a culture that's so different that we have no way to fully understand unless we live there even for 10 years and maybe we start to really understand. But the reason those people, you know, all over the world are living in much better relation to the earth is because they are in relation to the earth. They truly understand that intimacy. It's very intimate. It's literally like sex, right? It, it's very deep and there's trust and there is, you know, turmoil and there is emotion and there is not knowing. And, you know, there is a lot of movement in those energies when you work with the earth. You don't control really what's happening. Talk about face and surrender. I can plant my seeds. It doesn't mean it's going to come out of the ground, right? Even if I give all the love and all the care, but maybe it won't work. So you learn a lot of things about resilience, about transformation, about giving and receiving, about what does prayer really means? How does it work? Because it really works. But how does it work in a way that's authentic, that's not from ego, that's really in service of something much bigger, of the collective? And, you know, those people live well because they have so many other elements beyond their ceremonies, right? Their ceremony are usually, in fact, celebration of life, celebration of community, celebration of birth, celebration of death, right? But they're not the primary engine of transformation. The primary engine of transformation is the community. It's the relation. And then when I say that, beyond just human beings, right? All of it, right? The, the sky and the earth and the elements. And, but in a way, that's not new agey. That's so different from the way spirituality looks at it today. It's very primal. It's very direct. It's very authentic. And it's embodied fully. It's their life, right? In fact, none of the elder I work with talks about a spiritual practices or spiritual life because there's just one life. There's just one practice. There's not one that's not spiritual and <laughs> what that is. Yeah, right? that's, I think primal is the best way to describe it. Yeah. It's our return to the wild person inside. And wild doesn't mean, you know, when you say wild, we just imagine the crazy person running naked in the woods. But no, the wild meaning our true authentic nature. And our true authentic nature is to be of service of all that is in service of us already, right? We, the elements are in service of us, so the waters, and, you know, we, we are constantly being served. We're constantly receiving. And so we haven't really lived that way in the Western world, right? We, we've, been, we've been taking, right, things for granted or taking more than we need, right? But we don't live in true reciprocity. Which also in the, in the cosmology, you know, the, one of the first principles is the reciprocity. It's called Aini, right? It's good reciprocity. There's, there's a notion of exchange. Yeah, really well said. Here in Western culture, we definitely have more of a consume, consume, consume lifestyle, especially whenever it comes to our relationship with Earth. Being able to reiterate having these kind of beneficial relationships where we're giving back to the Earth like we're supposed to be, that's really what it's all about. And that kind of actually leads me to my next question. In addition to having the retreat center up there, you also are the founder of the New York Bee Sanctuary. 
I'd love to know mm-hmm. more about that and kind of what motivated you to advocate for bees and pollinators. Well, I've always been quite passionate about um, insect in general, <laughs> uh, from ants to bees and many others. Uh, in fact, when I was little, I, the books that I loved the most were about astronomy and the stars and about insect colonies, and especially ants. I was very fascinated by ants. Uh, I was mesmerized that there's an insect out there that bury the dead, that practice farming, that farms animals, like, you know, ants farm some other animals to get some milk, like we do with cows, that cultivate mushroom and other species of plant, like literally they make compost and, and they grow in the fields underground, (laughs) certain mushrooms and they harvest them. So I was very fascinated to see that, that such a simple, small insect had some very similar behavior than human beings. And I kind of never really understood why. Like, oh, is that possible? <laughs> and when I was doing my uh, travel in Nepal, I was hiking the Himalayas. And one day I was just... Uh, I got mesmerized by this bee. It was a white bee in the Himalayas that was sitting on a flower and just sat there. And I felt that I received a message from that bee. And what I heard was like, why is there botanical gardens and places for plants and trees? But there is, no, there is not the same for us, for insects, for bees, right? They say you do those things, you do the... The zoo and for animal and saving them, we do that for, you know, botanical garden, for plants and trees, but there's nothing for insect. I think it's because most people are grossed out by bugs and that's not fair. Biodiversity is biodiversity nonetheless. Yeah, I guess, right. I mean, we're some like butterfly, you know, conservatory things, but, you know, it's very limited, right? And at this idea, I was uh, saying in there, I say, I need to create a, a bee sanctuary, a, a place for the bees to, to thrive. And I came back with that ID when I was spent my year abroad. So when I came back to New York, it was one of the things I came back with. And I talked to a few friends and I said, hey, I had this crazy ID and what do you think? And we started, you know, this nonprofit. Now it's been, you know, uh, 10 years that it's around. And we have certified, yeah, I think over 500 lands across the United States, Canada, Europe, India. Uh, we have lands everywhere, in fact, that people have transformed into bee sanctuaries. And, uh, yeah, it it keeps growing and it always amazes me because there's only two or three of us and we're all volunteer. We don't take any money from it, but it's keep growing. And we got partnership with some big companies out there. And, you know, I'm going to go to New York city in a, in a few weeks to help installing green roof and beehives because I'm being contacted by this big real estate company that want to green their building. So yeah, it looks like the bees are are helping in the background <laughs> and uh yeah it's it's fun and you know it's uh it's a very big problem that we are facing uh the collapse of pollinators i think people don't realize at all uh what it means and how dramatic it is as we speak um and so yeah i feel like you know it's like a little drop in the ocean what we're doing but i feel you know we we do a lot of education in schools in New York and the Bronx and Brooklyn, and we do uh, a lot of information around it. And we also, you know, certify land. So we do, you know, practical land transformation, preservation with native flowers and plants. Um, so, yeah, that's a little uh, drop in the ocean for them, but I believe it's helping, you know. I definitely commend the work you're doing because bees definitely need help. The rapid decline of pollinators is something that should be discussed more and it's something we should all be aware of. I'd also like to hear your own personal experience with entheogenic plants and plant medicine, if you don't mind me asking. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, when I, you know, when I went to Peru, first time when I went the first time, I didn't even know that existed. So, But when I went a few years later, uh, someone mentioned that... You know, I was still kind of searching uh, my calling in some ways, I guess. Uh, And someone mentioned uh, the Shipibo tribe. 
to see there's these very ancient tribes that have this very unique language and and tradition and they work with this vine uh grandmother medicine i was like grandmother medicine what is that <laughs> and uh they don't use any instruments or in their ceremonies they just use their voice and they have this Icaros, those sacred songs, and those songs when they sing it, they they can go inside of you and take things out and change you and shift you. And and I was like, you know, I have a medical background, I have a PhD in veterinary medicine, like I said, and I was like, what? You can heal people just by singing on them like that with a plant. And so I decided to go in the jungle and, you know, do a, a dieta, which is a long format retreat where you spend many, many weeks in the jungle and you get to, to live with those people and, and do a lot of ceremonies. And it was, well, blowing my mind is an understatement. It was just like a whole new world. Like I was like, whoa, what is this? And a lot of people, you know, I was coming for curiosity and for personal healing more emotional and mental, but you know, there were some people there with us. Uh, there was a nun that was there. She had a stage three cancer. Wow. And I remember she was dressed as a, you know, Christian nun. Wow. <laughs> there were some like really diverse people there, all religions and all different kind of background and young, old, right? E everything. And we're all like sitting in the circle and spending the whole night together in the ceremonies. And, and I just witnessed, you know, powerful transformation and healing and, and, and people that arrive and that just maybe are addicted to something and come out and they have no more addictions and people that wanted to commit suicide and they come out, they are such a happy butterfly <laughs> and, and they, they fell in love with themselves again and, and they feel good about who they are and. And so, I, yeah, I decided to go back. You know, I went many times sitting with the sheep people. And, you know, I never felt called to, to serve this medicine, but I always knew that when we go through something very troubling, those people, out of many, there's other traditions out there, but those people have been perfecting probably the most advanced surgery and medicine on the planet because they've been doing that for 10,000 years. We don't know, maybe more. And they have refined such a precise instrument through their voice and the way they work with plants that is um, incredible. And it is complementary, like we said earlier, to your own work, right? It's not like it's going to do everything for you. In fact, it's very challenging. And on its own, if there's no support, I think it can be pretty difficult. But I think if you do that in complementarity of addressing what needs to be resolved in your life. You know, the relationship that are broken, the things that, where you have anger, where you have confusion, or the things you do that maybe don't really serve anyone but you, or maybe don't even serve you at all. <laughs> and you start addressing that, I feel like it can really save your life. In fact, I've witnessed people, life being saved and uh, really transformed by it. You know, and for now, many, many years, I bring people in Peru twice a year in those healing retreats. And it's just extraordinary always. You know, I feel like a child, you know, every time, even if I've been knowing those things for a long time. But I think in the right container with the right elders, with the right teaching around it and integration tool, I think some it's pretty miraculous. I mean, it's, it's probably not even a miracle. It's just the way. <laughs> those things works. Uh, but from a Western mind perspective, it can be seen really as a miracle. Wow. Yeah. That's really powerful what you said, especially saying that their tribe has perfected a very specific, precise, precise, advanced form of surgery. Um, something Western medicine can't even touch yet. That is very powerful stuff. Yeah. We're talking about really even changing, you know, um, brain connection in the brain. So addiction after one night is gone. Like people think differently. They don't have that craving anymore, right? Things that we don't really know how to do uh, at the moment with Western medicine, right? 
uh, or even cancer, right? I've seen so many people in very advanced cancer that came out healed, but not just of the cancer about what brought the cancer in the first place. Maybe that heartbreak because they lost someone very dear 10 years ago, or maybe other things that they need to heal so their body can find its way back to balance. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's so beautiful in so many ways. It's very sacred work. You know, now it's very popular and it's not always done in the right way. If you ask me and I think, you know, like, like everything we touch very often, we just make it a product and this is far from a product. It's very often taken out of context of cultural context. Uh, and I think. You know, that's, that's probably the problem today, but there's also, you know, a lot of people that are very serious about it and properly trained and working with elders, Western people I'm talking and that do really great work, right? So that that's also exists. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. And, you know, it's coming more mainstream, which I think in one, on one side is a good thing because <laughs> I think the world needs healing. Um, but on the other side, we need to make sure we don't contaminate those practices, those rituals, those people, those, uh, you know, those ancient tribes with our illnesses. And, uh, when you start bringing money and other things, it, it can really have a, a bad impact. And, you know, there's a lot of alcoholism now in the jungle and things that you didn't have 15 years ago. And so there is, there is definitely a problem about this interaction between their world and our world. And now it's, it's evolving, right? So I, I pray that there will still be in 10 years from now, places that it's still done in a very authentic way and, and in a very respectful way too. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. I mean, even though we're all thankful for accessibility and that this is available for people throughout the world now we want to make sure that we're moving forward with an authentic way and not just appropriating others culture making sure that we're dishonoring these thousands and thousands of year traditions that have been passed on through the actual tribal people i think like you said it's important that we nurture a sort of responsible relationship between the two yeah it's not we we are consumers right we just go we pay we consume and we go back home so we're using that as a product and this is not a product. This is a, a, a tradition. This is a, a culture, right? So I always tell people, take the time to stay longer, to arrive before, to get to know the people, to talk with them beyond your needs. How are they doing? What they need there, right? How is their land doing their waters? You know, there's a lot of issue with deforestation and extraction of resources from the ground and pollution of the waters and roads being cleared and you know it's it's a struggle for many many of the tribes today so we have to be very careful on how what we do might participate in that indirectly without us realizing even if we come with good intention we might not realize that in fact my lifestyle back home creates issues for them and we need to change that you know so not just go heal ourselves, and then, you know, forget about it and move on with our life. Yeah, I think that's really important to underline, honestly, that it's not just about going over there as like a, a tourist and then receiving the healing, going through the ceremony. And even if it's authentic and you're in, you receive the healing, but also making sure that your lifestyle back home isn't indirectly interfering with the preservation of these cultures. How do you, how do you navigate the balance between respecting the sacredness and the power of these entheogens and also their culture, but while also preserving that nature and also ensuring safety? Well, I think the most important is to build a relationship with the people. And I think that's the only thing, in fact, because I think once you have a relationship to something, it could be someone, it could be a land, it could be an animal, it could be a plant, it could be yourself, you understand the sacredness of it. And, and once you see the sacredness of it and the preciousness of it, respect and change of behavior naturally are an outcome of it, right? So what's missing is that we, we don't have relationship. 
And relationship takes time, right? Relationship takes deep listening. Like really listen to someone, not just coming to talk about our problem, but say, hey, what about listening first? And it takes commitment. You know, I, I cannot build a relationship with you if we just talk, talk on here, this podcast for one hour together, right? But if we get to talk and meet again and again and again, maybe in a few years, we'll get to know each other, right? But right now, I don't know you. You don't know me, right? <laughs> well, yeah, we might have the impression, right? Because we have a good experience and it's fun and it's nice. And I really appreciate the conversation, right? But to get to that more deep, intimate relating, we need to know more about each other. We need to listen more to each other. So I think that's that's the most important, right? To commit to, and, and that's why, you know, I was like, you know, years ago, I was like, I'm going to commit to this land and I'm going to commit to, to, commit to that lineage of Andean cosmology and the Andes. And I'm going to commit to my teacher there. And that's going to be a relationship for ever. <laughs> As long as it, I can last, right? Nothing is forever, but as long as it's possible, I'm not going to run away from it at the first difficulty or if we have a disagreement. And I think in the world of today, you know, people are so easily triggered by literally every freaking thing that they read or hear. And we run away all the time. It's like, oh, it doesn't work for me anymore. I'm going to go there. Oh, now there's a better place for me. Oh, this relationship doesn't work, right? It doesn't mean sometimes we don't need to cut the relationship. But most of the time, we don't take the opportunity of the struggle of the misunderstanding to deepen the relationship. We take that as an opportunity to somehow believe that we can run away and we won't be connected anymore, which from a native perspective, from a cosmology perspective, is a big lie because we're always connected, all of us. So distance is not going to change anything. It's an illusion. In fact, it's the Western mind of thinking that there is separation that does not exist once you start diving more into it. So, okay, well, if we can't separate, then how are we going to find our way back to each other? Are we going to learn from each other? Are we going to support each other? And when it comes to those ancient traditions, I always tell people, you know, Find the elders, call it in your prayer. Find the elder you want to work with or the teacher and commit to it. Commit to it. Don't get divorced every month and marry someone else because that's what people do with spirituality. We get married to this and divorce and divorce. You know, no, try to commit. And know that any relationship is difficult. There's nothing more difficult than deep intimacy with anyone or anything. That's going to be difficult. So put that first. Headliners, eh, it's going to be hard. There's going to be struggle. But out of the struggle, if we can work through that, some, something really powerful can happen. It's like me abandoning my land because there's a dry summer. Or uh, because this year somehow, you know, the plant didn't grow because reason that escaped me or that I can't understand. No, I'm not quitting on her because she's not quitting on me. I'm breathing right now. The trees haven't quit on me. I'm drinking water. The sky and the rivers have not quit on me. I'm drinking food. I'm eating food and plants and animals. They haven't quit on me. We have to realize that that relationship is with something that always care for us, is always in service. And our constant quitting is terrible. It's dishonest. It's a lie. Basically, we're lying to ourselves that somehow we can do that. But in fact, we can't. And we really have to respect the immense love that we're getting. Because to me, it's love, right? Receiving all that for free constantly without... I could be the most horrible person and not care about nature and burn forests and polluted rivers. I'm still going to be fed and have good hair to breathe and water from the earth, right? She's like this amazing mother, like unconditional love. Can I do that? back can i give that back to that level that kind of thing even when i'm upset to every children of the earth meaning my brothers and my sisters that sometimes upset me and triggers the hell out of me because i'm human can i commit to that kind of love that's the real stretch if you ask me you know 
I always tell people you, it's easy to love your dog. It doesn't require any any skills. You know? Or or my cat. I love my cat. Right? It, it, it's not really hard, right? Uh, to love a sunset or the night sky and the stars in the sky. Well, everybody can do that, right? The question is, can I love the part of creation that maybe are hard to to love, that are as divine? Even that president or that uh, CEO or that ex-partner, they're still a part of creation. They still, you know, are somehow inside carrying that magic. Can I find my way back? Can I still love? Right? Or do I just love because I'm getting something? Like my dog when I open the door, that wave its tail. But if he was not waving its tail and barking at me or trying to bite me sometime, would I still love it? Or do I love because I'm getting something out of it? That's not love. That's not love you're taking. Love is giving. It's giving. So, and dogs have understood that, right? They are very good lovers. <laughs> they're, they're, they're big givers, right? But what do we really love when we are in a relationship to that animal, right? So we really have to question the nature of our relationship ultimately. Because the way we learned it in the Western world is very broken. That's not true relationship. No, it's, a cont- it's contractual and it's imbalanced. It's not true reciprocity, right? I honestly think you may have just a- answered my next question I was going to ask. I was going to say, you've, you've studied Norse mythology, you've studied Andean cosmology, you've traveled all over the world studying multiple different cultures. I was going to ask what your biggest take-home message is for the listeners. What would be your biggest piece of advice? But like I said, I think you may have just answered it. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, you know, I'm going to quote uh, Manny with uh, Lakota elder uh, that live on Pine Ridge Reservation and that I spent some time with. And uh, I'm fascinated by the Lakota people and the tradition and their immense bravery and courage and uh, honor, despite all what they've been through and still going through today. Their capacity to be teaching me as a non-Native American person, to love me, to include me like family. To me, that's that's the biggest teaching I've ever received beyond anything else they've taught me. How to be a good human being, right? How to be kind, how to be forgiving, how to love, really how to, how to love. They, they show us the way. And one day I asked him, the same Annie, um, can you, this Lakota way of life, what is it about? Like, I mean, what's the core of it? I ask him kind of that, right? A little bit of what you're asking me. I say, what's the core of it? I say, if you could resume it in one phrase. So he sat there and um, he looked at me and he say, it's to be a good relative, to be a good relative. I was like, okay. So I was like, I think, you know, I get it. I right? like to be, you know, good relation with each other. Right? And then he added, he said, but you know, it's hard to be a good relative. <laughs> right. And that's the same in Indian cosmology. It's, it's, it's learning to be in good relation. And it means that when it's hard, when we have anger, when we have confusion, when we create separation, how do I return to that kind of love, to the one that really is feeding me, breathing me, beating my heart? Can I experience that when I look at my enemy and see the same beauty that when I look at the sky with the stars? That's what he told me. He said, you, you need to see the same beauty. If not, that's where your work is. So that's why we see you as a relative. That's why you are family. I mean, we're not saying little brother as a play of word. We mean it. You are family. 
like real family, like the tree. And they, and they have an experience of it. And I, it's so hard to, even for me, being walking this way for a long time, I don't experience it to that. Yeah, I can say it. We are related and all of that. But, but not, you know, I think there's still work for me to decolonize my mind, to really experience that in a way that, yeah, if I cut that tree, I'm going to cry like they just cut, or they just killed my grandfather. Like that level of grief putting their life, you know, on the line at Standing Rock for the waters because they were like, yeah, it's our mother. Well, we'll lose our life if we have to. It's our mother. You know, it's that, that level of relation, that level, level of connection is ultimately what all those tradition they are teaching us to find this way back into that sense of belonging, right? And there is... Yeah, many ways, many paths, many traditions. You know, I think they all bring something slightly different, but they're all talking about the same thing ultimately. They're all pointing at the end to the same place, right? Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. I think, like you said, they a lot of these are pointing to the same place, and I just really appreciate you sharing your insights. Um, to be honest with you, I could talk to you for hours. I hope to have you on the show again someday. With pleasure. Because um, I have I have so many more questions. We didn't even get to dive into North Shamanism. I really want to dive into that. I really I feel like you have so much to share. Thank you, Raven. I really enjoyed our conversation. And uh, it's very kind of you to yeah, interview me. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed being uh, connecting with you today. <laughs> yeah, you as well. I'm really I'm honored to host the space for us. Um, I really think that the listeners will appreciate our insightful conversation. Um, I guess my last question is where can anyone find you online or look up more information about your retreat center or anything like that? Yeah, people can go, you know, on, on my website. It's the sanctuaryheal.com. So the T H E sanctuary, like a sanctuary and the heal dot com. And you know, they can find me also on Instagram, the sanctuary dot angel dear, angel has two L. Uh, yeah, and you know, we do a lot of uh, online things for people that are not located in the Catskills. You know, we do a lot of ancient cosmology. In fact, we have our very big class starting early July for five weeks, taught by me and another teacher, where we're going to bring together Aztec, Mayan, and and then cosmology, cosmology from different lineages. Uh, we bring it together in a quite interesting format. It's online, right? So we we do that. We try as often as we can to bring uh, sharing that wisdom because you know it's not for me, really. It's what I receive. It's to be given, right? So uh, I'm just saying what I learn and sharing it, and hopefully it will change other people's lives. So yeah, please connect, you know, and or come visit if you're nearby. And Raven, you're invited. Come check the land, and yeah careful i'm only about six hours away yeah well we have a lot we have a lot of wood to chop <laughs> but no it's pleasure just come hang out and enjoy it's, it's such a magical place here it's uh the life is really uh, alive we we take a lot of time on the land we give a lot to it and we can feel it back thank you for listening to the sanctuary podcast We deeply value your support. Please consider sharing this podcast with others and joining our Patreon page at patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. Once again, it is patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. At the sanctuary, we believe that spirituality is a personal journey that takes many forms. And we honor and respect all paths to awakening and the rise of consciousness. Our mission is to provide a platform for open and honest conversations about spirituality and to inspire and empower our listeners to live their most authentic lives in good relation to each other's, the living, and invisible worlds. I look forward to connecting with you again here or at our events, retreats, and online gatherings. You can find all our offerings at thesanctuaryheal.com. Once again, it is thesanctuaryheal.com.